My name is Joseph Whelan. I've done over 24 years in prison for all types of crimes, uh, minor crimes and major crimes. The most serious crime has been attempt murder while in prison. My name's Philip Day. I'm 26 now. I spent approximately seven years in prison or one form of institution or another, you know, children's homes and what have you. And um, basically I was convicted for many crimes all relating to theft, burglary, theft of motor vehicles, motorbikes, money, jewellery. My name is Mike Thornton um, and until 10 years ago I was literally backwards and forwards in prison like a yo-yo. Sort of went through the whole stage of approved school, ball stall and then short prison sentences and was going nowhere with my life at that time. And can you tell us um, what you were put in prison for? Yes, mostly it was petty pilfering. Um, I did have other problems, but I usually got treated in the courts in other ways other than prison. So in prison it was nearly always for dishonesty. My name is Andrew Dyson and I've been inside three times for taking and driving away and once for police assault and section 18 assault and uh, TDA again theft. And how much time have you spent inside? Altogether, I would have done about three years altogether. Well, um, sort of when I became old enough to understand what was going on, it wasn't just a laugh and a joke anymore. I began to see that the dangers were that one was in, in no means encouraged to um, better themselves in prison at all, really. Um, prisons that already at that stage were overcrowded and understaffed. Um, there was a lot of um, time spent in the cell. Uh, you were literally herded around like sheep. You were given a number, so you lost your identity. You lost the need to think for yourself. You'd get woken up in the morning, sometimes seven o'clock, by a kick on the door, and you'd just hide under the covers and, until the last minute. And then you'd finally just about crawl out of bed by the time they opened the door. And you'd have to slop out then, get your water for the day, um, get dressed. And then you'd be waiting for your breakfast, waiting for the officer to shout you to go down for your breakfast. Um, you'd have to march down a landing with 50 other guys, queue up for your food, come back to your cell with it, eat it in your cell. Um, then you'd have to put your tray out, they'd kick the door again, you'd put your tray out. Um, then you'd be probably banged up for the rest of the morning until dinner time. On your way in from exercise, you collect your lunch. You're locked up till half one. You put your tray out and slop out, and you're locked up again till quarter to four. You go on exercise again. This is the summer regime now. And uh, if it's winter, you're locked, unlocked earlier because of the light outside. And weather permitting, you have another half hour's exercise. You get your tea just after four and you're locked up then for the evening. That's you finished till the next morning. An officer will come around half six, quarter to seven, let you get a jug of water and slop out. You get a cup of tea and that's you finished then. The door is not opened again. You get an hour's exercise it's in the afternoons and the mornings alternatively. Uh, you know, if you're interested in going to the gym, you can go to the gym and you know, do weights and exercise there, uh, which is once a day. And, you know, you're just in your cell mainly most of the time. Uh, on the convicted side for the YPs, there's classes at night, you know, English, maths, art, and uh, you know, different classes and that. So, mm. When I was about um, 15, I was convicted and um, I was waiting to be sentenced at court and I had to spend four months in, um, in the block because I was rather rebellious at that time and um, I mean there was no windows on the cell, it was, there was ice on the floor outside and everything and I really um, kicked against the system and as I say I got 92 days in solitary and um, being a young lad as well I was um, really broken at that time and um, then on top of that I got four years detention under the Children and Young Persons Act and um, it just seemed as if I couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. When you look upon the processes you go through in prison there is often the dawning slowly that you are 
uh, in a helpless, hopeless position, um, that you can do nothing for those and anything for you outside. Um, you're trying to um, equate being fair with your loved ones outside with not being too selfish, if you know what I mean. You, you, you want to see them every day, but you know that you can't. Um, you know that they've got problems because you're not there, but you can do not a thing to help them. You're always on at the, the welfare or the chaplain to do something for you, and he, of course his time is limited. And so the frustration sets in. You're always fearful that the relationships that you have are not going to be there at the end of the prison sentence. That's what's called expecting a dear John. And um, very often people anticipate that and say to their loved ones, you know, don't wait for me. Well, actually it was in this prison, Strangeways Prison here, that one of my worst moments was. And uh, I cut a man up so bad in one of the workshops here with a chisel that I got done for attempt murder on his life. And when the prison officers came and dragged me away and took me down to the punishment centre, they, uh, I thought the man was dead because staff had came and told me the man was dead. And the governor then, he was a major, uh, an ex-major, came in in the middle of the night to tell me that this man's life had been saved. And the charge was dropped from attempt murder to feloniously and maliciously wounding. Ross Peart, Methodist minister, part-time chaplain here, and trainer in evangelism on the outside. Morris, four eight. Yes, your man. Hi, Mr. Morris. Morris, Mr. Morris. Morris, Morris. 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 Have a seat on the far side there, your man. Now, Mr. Morris, Methodist chaplain here, Ross Peart. Yes. Um, have you been in prison before? Yes. Yeah. So you know that the chaplain is here to help. Yes. And it's your right to see a chaplain yes. about anything that bothers you. Okay. Yes. So your head's getting yeah. banged a bit. Yes. Okay. So uh, what's your sentence this time? How long? Uh, Fifteen. Five years. Five years. Yes. Three months. Now I see you're on reallocation. Yes. Where, where, where have you come from, Mr. Morris? Well, yes. How much of your sentence have you done? Fifteen months. Right. Now, do your family know where you are now? No. They don't. No. Do you want them to know? Yes. You I do. think a lot of these fellows have a, a real identity crisis when they come in here. They actually become a number rather than a name. And I believe that we can present a very personal Jesus, my Jesus, to them, that can actually uh, make them feel that they're special. Uh, I'm special because God don't make no junk. That's one of my ways in with them. Yes. Uh, we're here and we'll give you any help we can. Many people say they don't have a conscience. I actually believe they do, but I take a different approach. Rather than speaking about sin, I talk about being a slave or out of control, like their heavy accelerator foot is out of control or they're in slavery. And I say that Jesus can, by his spirit, come in to control them, and he also can strengthen their will and resolve. That's the kind of approach that I would take with them. But these fellows uh, don't receive truth very easily because they are taught in life to deal in deceit and lies and it is a real problem, it's only the Holy Spirit who by his own work in their lives can lead them into truth. Ave Maria, gracia plena, dominus tecum, benedicta tu. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. And tonight we're gathered together to celebrate the Eucharist. And we offer this Mass, a uh, votive Mass, to the Holy Spirit. In this Mass we pray for ourselves. We pray for those who cannot pray with us tonight. We also remember those who do not wish to pray with us tonight. As always, before we celebrate the Eucharist, let us call to mind our faults and our failings and ask God's forgiveness. Yeah, I'm Father Peter Smith, RC Chaplain here in Strange Ways and Risley Man Centre. I think um, you have to appreciate that not all people have experienced good things in, in life. Uh, even the love of parents, families, um, they may have other material things, but that 
personal relationship with other people, often it's lacking. Um, and so, uh, to get to know a person, an inmate, uh, a prisoner, to, to, to share with them something of yourself and make him feel that he is appreciated as a person. No matter if there's drugs problems or alcohol, alcohol problems or whatever personal problem there is, to appreciate the person, not condoning the crime, but the person, the value of the person. We come here week by week and really we invite people in to come and share with you what God has done in their lives. Because we I'm Ian Ferguson, I'm the Church Army Evangelist here at Manchester Prison. Like I've been in the prison service for about 19 um, years now and mainly since being at Manchester my work has been with young offenders. It's only about your age. Uh, he hails from the wilds of Rochdale. Anybody here from Rochdale? Well, okay, so we've got one or two from Rochdale. So, <laughs> Gareth, um, I'm going to ask to share with you now something about, well, how he came to meet with Jesus and the difference that Jesus has made in his life and... I think the first thing is to try and, and get alongside, and you know, um, now, uh, to understand stage, sort of the environment which they may have come from, actually, and to be able to sort of Bible say to a person, first and foremost, you know, that they have some worth, that they have some value in the sight of God. Everybody has told them they're no good, they're not worth anything, they'll always end up here, and when they do, the people that have told them that then reject them. And so I think there's a point of sort of uh, accepting them and I think the majority of people in prison have a great need to know you know that they are accepted uh, and most certainly to find out that they're accepted by God they brought me back from Jersey for some major crimes in this country after being released from Jersey prison Lemoy prison I got arrested at the gate and flown back here and all sorts of major crimes until the 3rd of August 1983 they took me to Risley and they didn't process me as they process you because they knew what I was. Me going to Risley was like going home. Everybody knew me as here and Liverpool, you know, Durham. They used to call me by my first name, the staff, you know. And uh, what happened was they took me down the dungeons and uh, there was nothing in the cell, absolutely nothing in the cell, only three pieces of wood built into concrete. That was your bed and there was nothing else in the cell. And the smoking began and the walking up and down began. And uh, after some time I got sick of smoking. And I was on category A, I believe. I was on special watch. And I broke my watch and tried to cut my wrists. And I couldn't do that right. I was 42 years of age. I started to cry that I was gonna get a lot of porridge this time. I didn't cry. I was crying for myself, feeling sorry for myself. That was the reason I was crying. And uh, I seen the face of my wife that ha had had misery for 18 years through living with me and I wanted to kill myself. And sometime in the middle of the night I lay down on these three pieces of wood and fell asleep. And uh, the next morning I woke with not a care or a bother in the world. And my little girl would say to you, me daddy went to bed and his twin got up. They unlocked me early to have a wash and uh, as I was washing I started to smile and the officer asked me why are you smiling William and I said to him I think Jesus has helped me and uh, I still can't answer you today why I said that. Um, I was in Walton and um, I was at a particular low time then and I was banged up 23 hours a day on H-Wing and um, one night, just before we were ready to, to be locked up for the rest of the night, I went along the landing asking any of the lads have you got any decent books to read? And all I could get was like half a book. I literally had the front and back cover ripped off it. And it, I knew it was, it had the edge on it with the name and it was called Hell's Angel by Brian Greenaway. So I went back to my cell and I thought, um, I'll have a quick read, see what it's about. And I've discovered from the forward that it was about a man who was a hell's angel who became a Christian so I thought to myself oh I'll read the exciting bit about the hell's angel 
And when it starts going on about Christianity, I'll just sling it. Anyway, I started reading the book, and through reading the book, I was able to identify with Brian Greenaway. And although I hadn't actually committed the same types of crimes as him, I was um, on like the same level in my own experiences. And through reading that book, I knew that God had met his need, and I asked God, I really cried out to God in my cell that night, and I asked God to meet my need. Um, just over 10 years ago now, in strange ways, on remand, and um, if really through the testimony of another inmate who I'd known four years before on my last prison sentence, and who I just couldn't believe was the same person. So that dramatically changed life very much, made me sit up and take notice. I then heard his testimony given in the chapel, and so I knew how, how his life had changed. I was at that stage of being so full of bitterness because I knew I shouldn't have been there. I was going um, to the chapel at that time and having heard his testimony, maybe for the right reasons, for the first time, and then listening to what um, Noel Prutzer was saying, and he was preaching in a way I'd never heard it preached before, as though he had experienced what he was talking about. It's about the only way I can describe the difference between him and the many other preachers I'd heard preach. Um, so there was this changed life of another inmate. There was the way that I was hearing the gospel in a new way. There was where I was at in my own life, mostly dealing with this real deep feeling of bitterness, which I hadn't ever encountered before in prison. got some people coming in from Whitehaven on Friday night and when you're introducing them uh, there's a pastor walker and uh, this he's bringing some of these folk in so basically we want them to feel that uh, you've given them a very warm welcome. As My name's Noel Proctor and I'm the Church of England chaplain in Strangeways Prison. I've been here now 10 years where each of us are concerned if we take our eyes off the Lord Jesus Christ we begin to falter and fall. If we begin to depend on ourselves to get us through the job, we will falter and fall. I think when you're dealing with human nature, and especially human nature which has fallen and sometimes feels that there's no possibility of being able to rise out of the, the mire and, and, the, and the difficulties that they've allowed themselves to get into, you've got to sell hope. And we thank you, Lord, for the way that you brought Sydney to know yourself. And Lord, even though he's so far away from his home and his family, that he's been able to share the beauty and the loveliness of the Lord Jesus Christ with them and with the men in this prison. And so, Father, we just pray now that you'll bless these lads who are coming on the confirmation class and grant that the decisions that they have made for the Lord Jesus will grow through their experience of getting to know the scriptures and getting to know you in a deeper way. Grant, Lord, that as Sidney shares his experience of the power of Christ in his life, that they may be drawn to know you in a deeper and a greater way. We ask it for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. I'm thrilled uh, and excited. I'm just a Jesus boy myself and I get excited about him and when anybody else comes to Jesus then I get excited. But I'm particularly excited when there are remarkable conversions. I actually believe in a God-centered evangelism which really means unless God moves by the power of his spirit a man's decision is worth nothing. And I actually think we've emphasized deciding for Christ too much. And I actually think that Jesus Christ arrests people. <laughs> he literally gets hold of them. Uh, and that's the image that I, I long and pray for, that by our prayers and by our witness, we get out of the way and we let God do his work in depth. Well, over a period of time, it is possible to see some inmates uh, change and want to share in the various activities of the chaplaincies. And, uh, would seem to grow just a little at times, you know, you, you, you can't perceive a growth in some inmates, you know. When you get sort of three or four hundred men and boys in a chapel service, I mean, anyone would be sort of stupid to think that they were all sort of coming to praise the Lord. They come for a smoke, they come to meet someone off a, a, another landing, to have a shout to a friend, uh, but um, where else could you sort of be able to speak to three or four hundred people who didn't? believe the gospel, who wouldn't go into a church in the hope that something would happen. Uh, 
some of them will f use the gospel as a crutch. Uh, in some ways, what's wrong with that? Their lives which are broken, if you have a broken leg, you use a crutch to give you support. When you have a broken life, why not find sort of that Jesus is that crutch, is that support? Well, I remember this guy came up to me one day, the cleaner, my mate, and he said, uh, Ian Ferguson, which is a chaplain who deals with YPs, is, is putting us both on the prayer meeting, it's on tonight and that, and uh, people are going to, you know, see if, they, see if they want to, you know, come to know Jesus and that. He's going to give people a chance, you know, uh, to pray with them and that. He said, what do you think? And I was sort of, hmm, you know, because inside I guess I wanted it because I was really screwed up, you know, my head was really gone, I didn't know who he was. But I sort of seen Christianity and that sort of thing as, as, as a crutch of people, as a, as a, you know, for weak people and that sort of thing. And, and in prison you've got to like, I guess you've got to anyway, you know, sort of, you know, not, not showing your weakness and like that. Yeah. But that night we went to the prayer meeting uh, and at the end, you know, Ian said, okay, you know, I can't remember his exact words, but, you know, he asked people who wanted to, you know, be prayed for and that to come to know Jesus and that. And a lot of people stood up, including me, make the cleaner. And I just thought, no way am I standing up. <laughs> I just thought, you know, I couldn't do it in that. And he's like, come on, get up. I said, no, man. So he got prayed for and that. And I just thought, oh, I could walk out of this prayer meeting and never thought, I really wanted to know inside. And it was just like pride and, and you know, things like that was stopping me. And I, I thought I could walk out here and never feel so close again to sort of, you know, this decision saying yes or no. So I just stood up and I felt just shame, you know, and everything, ashamed and everything. But I stood up and Ian prayed for me, it was. And uh, I just said in my mind, God, if you're there, you know, just let me know, man, I need you and that, you know, because I'm, I'm just messed up on that. I mean, I am so grateful for what the Lord's done for me in my life and I can actually look back and see what I have now and what I and compare that with what I used to not have, if you like. Um, and all I want to do is make him the central body in my life. Um, the best way of describing how it affects my life is that I tend to look upon him as my father and as his son I do not want to disgrace his name. Um, and so really I'm putting in trying, I'm human, to put him first in everything. It doesn't always work, especially when it comes to watching Arsenal on the box. I have a love that I didn't know existed. And sir, I cry for people where I could never cry before. I cry over people's situations, and that's God showing me that only he can deal with situations where I try to deal with them, that only he can deal with them. Because sometimes I get in the way of God doing his work. I work for the trust, the Langley House Trust, who uh, took me on by faith. We go from week to week by faith. I pick men up at the gate. Uh, I have a burden for the married Hello, man well, well, coming out of prison. How are you? Oh, good, thanks. Was it hard? No, it was like that, basically. I got some good news from your sister in Reading, Sue. Oh. She'd love to see you. That's good. Right. Someone gave me a gift for you somewhere. Don't mind, no, go ahead, go ahead. Right, there's a gift someone gave me to give you. Oh, good, right, so you. what we intend to do now is take you to my house. Okay. Get cleaned up and there's some clothes there somebody gave me for you. Right. Have a breakfast, but on the way, we'll stop and have a cup of coffee so you can get your head together. Okay. For that, okay. Right. Thank you. I firmly okay. believe that if you get the man and you get the wife soon after because she's seen such a change, this happened in my life. So I'm speaking from the Lord brings you through it. He doesn't lift you over it or bring you around it. And when he's brought you through it, you can deal with others that are going through it. Don't forget your belt. Well done. Hallelujah. When a man makes a commitment of his life to Christ, for instance, during the Billy Graham mission that we had here, between 150 and 170 men responded to the, the challenge and committed their lives to Christ. Now, what we do, we got their addresses, uh, we got in touch with clergy of, in that area, uh, uh, whichever denomination they came from, and endeavor to build up a relationship, even got the clergy to come in and visit them. And as, as a result of this, we have built up contacts all over the place. The vicar comes, if he hasn't got a home to go to, we've got the Adullam homes, the Langley Trust homes, and now this home in Manchester run by the Christian Alliance. We also have a, a number of prison visitors who are very helpful in the sense of being able to get men jobs. And uh, as a result of this, a number of men have been able to go out of here and go straight into a job.
When we um, get to the prison, we're issued with cell keys and we go to the cells of men who have asked for visitors. I've visited some people who didn't want their family and friends to know they were in prison. And so perforce they weren't getting any visitors, but they still felt the need of outside contact. There is help available within the prison. There is help from chaplains, uh, from probation service, welfare and so on. But there is, I think, a feeling in some of the men that they value contact with an ordinary member of the outside society who is not part of the formal prison structure. I know that the message I've found, um, the life in Christ that I've found, it is able to meet the needs of the fellows in here. And I just hope and pray that um, this video will be able to speak to somebody and through it that God might meet human need through my life. I don't know what my future is. I'm actually literally waiting to, always waiting to be told what the Lord wants to do next. So it's very uncertain. I just know that it's going to be a fulfilled future because the Lord has promised me that. Um, and that um, because I now have a different being in me now, that um, it's going to be one where I just hope I can carry on being in a position where I can care for others. As I just, you know, yield to Christ more and more, and as I just let him take control of my life, and I just know that as long as, I'm, you know, I remain submitted to him, that things are just going to go uh, good. I'll have trials in that, but they're for my own good in that. And, uh, you know, I just, I just want God to use me, you know, wherever he wants to use me. Just tell me what you've got now, Joe, that you didn't have when you were in that cell with the three pieces of wood. Everything. Everything under the sun. I want for nothing. There's lots of things I would like, but nothing I need. And I, although I'm uh, involved with the Langley Trust and work for the Langley Trust, I'm answerable to God first and the Langley Trust second. Because I find in my heart of hearts that when you do things the way God wants you to do, then you're right with man.